I guess that's why you're here. <laughs> we are friends of Jim's. <laughs> that could be the new title of God. Well, good evening. Are we good to go back there? Woohoo! Yeah, yeah. Well, good evening and welcome to OC Singles for Christ. How are we doing tonight? Woohoo! Yes, it is so good to be here to be in the house of the Lord. It has been a crazy week filled with chaos and craziness. We were praying earlier that we'd be able to just lean into the Holy Spirit tonight and just worship him in spirit and in truth and let the cares and worries of the world just melt away in his presence. Amen? Yes. Amen. On that note, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. My name is Jessica. Say hi, Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Hello, family. So good to see you once again. I missed you. For those of you that have joined online, welcome. We're so glad that you've tuned in. And uh, hello to my mama in Minnesota. They got another five inches of snow, and it's March. I'm oh, so bye. sorry. Oh, dear. But, you know, okay, maybe I won't comment on that. <laughs> We've had plenty of rain. Yes, we have. And whenever it rains here, they get snow. That's just kind of how it works. But um, at least here in California, we get the option of having 70 degrees like the next day, oh, right? Yes. And sunny. Yes. So I'm not complaining. Who's had a good week this week? I can't see anything, so I'm sorry. I have to put my hand over my eyes. Who's that? Oh, we have people that have had a good week this week. Mm -hmm. Is that just because your week was normal and good, or did something good happen this week? Anyone? Who had something exciting and good happen this week, and that's why it's good? Who's just say, saying, you know, God is good, therefore it was a good week? How about yes. that? Yes. Okay, I'll accept mm -hmm. that. Amen. Well, no matter what kind of week you've had, we hope that we can make your week a little better. We are here to be family, to be one voice that worships our king, and just enter in, into his beautiful presence. Can you, by the way, please give a warm welcome to my team tonight. We've got Daryl, we've got Kevin, we've got Kim and Alan, and why don't we stand together and let's worship our awesome Savior tonight. those hands together tonight. Lord, we give thanks to you. Forever you are faithful. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that has been reborn, his love endures forever. We sing praise, we sing praise.
someone an elbow next to you and say his love will endure forever no matter what you go through come on amen let's continue to worship
You guys can give the Lord some praise. Come on. You know, I've always thought it interesting that the serpent did not tempt Adam and Eve to steal in this moment, to steal or to kill or to commit adultery. 
He simply tempted Adam and Eve to question God's word to them. Isn't that the biggest challenge in our lives? Did God really say? Did he really do that? Our faith. But guess what? Tonight, God says, you are whole in him. He says, you are restored. You are redeemed. You are cleansed. You are healed. You are forgiven. You are free. So, Lord, as we just bow our hearts before you tonight, we proclaim your goodness over our lives. And we say yes and amen to what you have said about us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. see shattered but you see whole I see broken but you see beautiful and you're helping me to be
There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy. I am clean. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make. Wash me in mercy, I am clean. Amen. <laughs> Father, what a beautiful promise that in you in you and you alone, we are washed clean and made white as snow. Lord, as we inch our way closer to Easter Sunday in this season, Lord, we are so grateful for your great sacrifice. We are washed in your blood, a blood that flowed red but made us pure white. And Lord, tonight, Father, we ask for a refreshing in your spirit tonight, that you would come and refresh us in your hope, refresh us in your healing, refresh us in restoration and, and all the things that have broken our hearts, Lord. Heal our hearts tonight. Refresh us in freedom. Refresh us in redemption. We are made whole and in you all things are possible. So thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. I ask that you would touch every heart that can hear my voice tonight. Lord, that they would know how much you love them. You've always loved them, and you will never stop loving them, no matter what. But Lord, that same token, would you remove anything that gets in our way of receiving the fullness of you? Take it from us, Lord. So, Lord, tonight we give you our lives, and as we enter into your word tonight, Lord, open our hearts to fully receive from you as we glorify you and bless your name. And it's in your blessed name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen. 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 Give it up for Jessica and the band, would you? They, they're going to take a short break. And they'll be back up here in just a moment, uh, in a few moments. Go ahead and have a seat. Did you introduce the band already? You did. Awesome. I was running around in the back. I love that last song. Wash us in the blood. Uh, that we're all dirty in some way, shape, or form. God has a wonderful way of renewing us and restoring us and washing us in the blood and of his precious son. And in that uh, community of faith that as Christians we're all a part of. We can count on the fact that we have a God who loves us, crazy about us. My picture's right smack in the center of his refrigerator. I don't know where yours is, but uh, we're all somewhere in there, but we're all uh, greatly uh, loved by him and uh, love that song. Uh, so welcome uh, to Orange County Singles and Couples for Christ. Glad that you're here this evening. I uh, hope you had a good week. And uh, as we wrap uh, this week up on a Friday night, and anybody here for the first time? Just raise your hand. If you're here for the first time, all newbies. No, I know we have some, uh, well, maybe not. So I had some uh, card, yellow cards filled out. That generally means it's a visitor, but that's okay. Well, uh, let's continue to move forward here. Um, so a uh, couple of things I need to cover before we uh, break out into our classes uh, this evening is, uh, well, yeah, let's do that right now. We did not do that last week. So we have this thing called a meet and greet. That means get out of your chair, get a little uncomfortable, give somebody a nice handshake, or if you know them really well, a side hug, and just say, hey, great to see you tonight. Thanks for being here. You got two minutes. The clock is now ticking. Get up.
I really want to see. All right, 50 seconds. Get around, 50 seconds. Say hello. Hey, Dr. Mark, God bless you. Good to see you. All right, 20 seconds. Time to start heading back to your seat. Boy, you guys are awesome. All right, hey, a couple of things before we get into our breakout classes. I wanted to bring to your attention here some pre-announcements, if I may. Uh, number one, coming right up here in just a jiffy is a shot of the TV. Hi, how's it going, everybody? Yeah, the cameras had a great shot of the drum set. Great, yeah, great drum set, yes. So anyway, a couple things here. Is, uh, one of the things I've really been appealing to all of you over the last month or so, and I'm going to continue for another three weeks, is that we really would invite you to pray for this ministry. And uh, one way to do that so you don't forget is just simply take your cell phone and talk to Siri or Bixby or Alexa on your phone and just say, set alarm for 517 Monday through Friday. All you need to do, it's done. And when your phone... Uh, starts doing its thing and ringing, as mine does. Uh, there are uh, several things we're, we would love for you to be praying for. One is our elder board as we meet and make decisions. Myself as the senior pastor for continued growth here, financial strength, and obviously the needs of the body of Christ. You may not know what they are, but I can guarantee you this. He's, our Heavenly Father knows exactly who needs to be touched uh, through prayers, even though they may be a blind Prayer, God knows exactly how to direct that. And that really comes out of 1 Thessalonians 5.17, where we're encouraged to pray without ceasing. So I want to leave with that with you and just really from a, a deep uh, appreciative heart, but also a humble heart and a needy heart, please be praying for this ministry. Next slide, if I may, is uh, we're in the need of a, a, a laptop. If you happen to, uh, one person uh, was gracious to come forward last week with a laptop, and we tried to make it work. I think they're still working on that. Did that work? Uh, I think they need to look at that. Well, we're looking for uh, a, a used laptop if you would like to donate one. Maybe you've got a laptop sitting all over your house. We're looking for something with an i7 processor or faster, uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM or random access memory, and 4 gig of uh, RAM, virtual random access memory. Forget about the RAM. We can always increase that, but it's the processor, the motherboard, that really needs to get an i7. Uh, or faster. It works with these programs that we have here. So, with that said, next slide, and see me afterwards if that's something you can uh, fill in. Okay, so our breakout classes for this evening. I'm in this room uh, starting a new series called Can God Use Me as a Single Adult? Stick around and find out. But even better, if you would like to know what the Holy Spirit is and who He is and what He's doing in our lives, we have a breakout class also led by Pastor Mark Presley. Pastor Mark is right there. And so he's going to lead you to the fellowship hall where that class will take place there. So get up. If you want to be a part of that class, please. Uh, Mark is waving his Bible and uh, would love for you to join him, join him in the fellowship hall. Okay. All righty. So anyway, we're starting a new series here. Uh, can God, does God use single adults? And I put my, uh, where's Reuben? Hey, uh, I left my glasses right on next to your Coke. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at my notes going, uh, I can't read this. Uh, oh, yeah, Egyptian. <laughs> All right, so we're starting a five-week five -week class on this new series looking at the biblical record for God using single adults. Does God have a plan yeah, to be used by his glory? And so we're going to take a look at some single adults that God has used to change the world, 
change ethnic backgrounds, change lives in particular? And why is that an important question to answer? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you so much. In our society today, people are killing themselves every day. People have lost hope. Overwhelming bills, overwhelming medical bills, or maybe medical issues that are just seem insurmountable. Mental afflictions, personal breakups, people killing each other for money to buy drugs to sustain habits. All of those and many, many, many more are killing, uh, many more, many more issues are killing us. And now there's a new gorilla in the room. And that gorilla is called social media. Did you know, have you guys ever heard of TikTok? You guys ever heard of TikTok? That is a uh, program supposedly comes out of China. And uh, also, I, I, as I've read, it is uh, monitored by and influenced by uh, Communist China for our uh, country and other. But did you know that uh, within TikTok, there are, app, there are challenges to actually bring you to the edge of life before you hit death. Did you know that? There's 10 things that are raging on TikTok right now that are death challenges. Like, and I'm just going to cover a couple, eating a bunch of salt as fast as you can. It's called the salt challenge. As crazy as that may be, it is. And that basically is to guzzle as much salt as you can because it causes... Uh, uh, Dehydration, confusion, nausea, and uh, other things that bring on seizures. So you want to bring yourself to a place where you almost die. Then there is the cha-cha slide. Have you heard about that one? The song cha-cha slide, to the left, to the left, to the right. Okay, whatever. I'm not a dancer. But this one is taking your car and going to this left, to go to the right in conjunction with or in tandem with that song, which is killing people. Obviously so, because you're jerking your car in violent ways in order to, uh, to flip the, the idea is to flip your car over. There's the penny challenge. Take a penny and stick it in the wall socket so you can get a real charge out of life. Killing people. Go figure. There is the full face wax challenge. Cover your face with wax. Well, what does that do? It hardens and it causes you not to be able to breathe, hence you die. This is nut stuff. There's the, I think I said, the, did I mention the fire, uh, the fire challenge? Fire challenge is to drench yourself with flammable liquid and light yourself on fire. This is true stuff. I'm not making this up. Then there's the Benadryl uh, challenge. To, uh, to down a bunch of gen uh, 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 Benadryl because it gets you to a high and then you start hallucinating. And if you obviously take too much, you'll kill yourself. And then there's the blackout challenge. This one isn't too new. I remember this back in the 70s, what's known as the choking game. You guys remember that one? Maybe you played it and you're still here, thank God. Basically, if you choke an individual to get them to faint. Hey, this is, a, this is what our youth are looking at in the absence of hope. Fentanyl use. Homelessness obviously has a lot of different uh, reasons for homelessness. And one brush doesn't cover all the issues, but people have lost hope. It's incredible. And uh, the sad thing is hopelessness leads to, if it can lead to one taking one's life. I don't know if you read this or not, this came out last week. There was a CDC survey uh, involving 17,000 youths. Uh, and check this out, it's girls are especially at high risk for mental health issues. 60% of young teen uh, girls in the United States reported feelings of persistent sadness, hopelessness, and 30% have contemplated suicide. That's sad. And nearly 20% of those ladies, so 17,000 times two, that's about 3,400 have experienced violent sexual advances. The LGBT community of teenagers is also struggling with half of them wanting to kill themselves. They've lost hope. And actually 20% of them have attempted suicide. And then adolescents in general are facing mental health challenges exacerbated by the uh, COVID um, pandemic. And more than 40% of all of them are feeling, reporting feeling sad, 
or hopeless in the last year. Hopelessness. It's amazing what's taking place. You know, if I was a lady today and I was playing sports, I'd really be hopeless. Because you have an agenda today that's allowing men to play in women's sports under the guise of being transgender. And it's totally unfair, for one, not right for another, because a man's physical body is simply much more powerful than an, on average than a woman's body. We have more blood. We have more muscular. Uh, uh, we have more muscles. Um, we're generally taller. The guy that was uh, swimming for the University of uh, Pennsylvania, remember that guy that won in all the things last year? The guy's six three, and the gals, the rest of the gals are five seven, five eight. I mean, it's just unfair and uncompetitive, and people are checking out. I do have to give an applause towards, I forget, it's the track and field, the worldwide track and field, have said, believe the science. Science says there's only two genders. Last time I checked, male and female. And so they've said that if you are a biological male, you cannot compete in women's sports. I'm like, following the science? I thought that's what uh, everything was all about, following the science, only if it pertains to your particular viewpoint and what you want to uh, push on people. But they are following the science. Finally, somebody is recognizing the obvious. You're either a male or you're a female. It's pretty simple. But women are losing hope in the sports world. Our society over the last 50 years has pretty much thrown God out the window. In doing so, people are left without a source, really the only source, for hope and significance in life, and that is God. We've taken the rug out from people's lives, and now we're reaping the whirlwind. Does God care about the single adult? Many don't think so today. Statistics are simply bearing that out in survey after survey after survey. People are losing hope. God in his infinite wisdom has chosen you and I as his kids and has given us the privilege to be co-workers with him in building his kingdom here on earth. Now today is a spiritual kingdom. You don't have kings and queens and princesses and princesses. You don't have palaces. You don't have moats, security cameras, guards on horses and all that kind of good stuff. However, it is a very real kingdom and yet it is unseen. And soon it will be seen, and the entire world that remains when the kingdom comes will recognize that God's been here all along. No surprise there. God has been actively involved, and God will vindicate himself against every naysayer or atheist in that day. And there will be no unbelievers in that day, by the way. Every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. End of story. That God is using people like you and I to further his kingdom here on, all, here on earth right now is giving you and I unbelievable opportunities to witness of his great love and care. And that there is hope and there is significance to this life in which we live. To be able to reach out and rescue those who are held captive by the adversary, Satan himself. And as we do so, some may turn and accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And as we look at some of the Bible characters and examine their lives, we've got to remember that none of them in the Old Testament see what we see today. They didn't know about Jesus Christ. They knew faintly that there was a Messiah to come, but not really a whole lot more than that, or that the, permanent, the Holy Spirit would permanently reside in people's hearts as they do today. None of us, Old Testament and saints alike, knows what lies ahead. But Scripture does tell us that your future is going to be glorious. I love the phrase that says this, earth is as bad as it's going to get for you and I. The best is yet to come. In the meantime, we trust, we obey, we pray, and we walk by, with God by faith. Through storms, upsets, conflicts, we keep our eyes on the prize that's laid before us, and that is following Jesus Christ. Tonight I want to tell you a story. I haven't done this before in telling stories, but I'm going to tell you a story that covers ten chapters of the Old Testament. These ten chapters are full of intrigue, hatred, beautiful people, riches untold, arrogance, murder, sleeplessness, humble people. And for the sake of time, I've, I'm going with the highlights of those ten chapters. 
so that, but I know and I trust that you'll get the gist of where I'm coming from. You know, the stories of the Bible and stories in general are meant to capture our imagination and get us to fantasize about the reality of the story. Last week I went to go see uh, Jesus' Revolution for the second time. I actually liked it better the second time around than I liked it the first time. You just, you missed a whole lot of stuff. I had no idea that in my roots as a Christian, we're straight out of the Jesus Revolution, Jesus movement of the 70s and 60s. I was leading Bible studies in the Bay Area back in the early 80s, and I was leading the worship part, teaching the Bible study, and leading the worship part of it, and I was using this book that was straight out of Calvary at Maranatha, which was part of the Jesus movement. I had no idea that any of this stuff was, had taken place. And through the movie, I, I've learned of that. I cried through that movie. I was moved by the scenes of love, and the tragedy of addictions. Uh, that, they really touched me. It's a different movie and a different take about Jesus Christ and how he's moving in the lives of three individuals, Lonnie Frisbee, Greg Laurie, and Chuck Smith. Now, there were another 20 or so, or so people that were really integral to the movement that are not told in the movie, obviously because of time. You just can't develop the full theme. But what makes for a good movie is good, direct, good writing, a good script, a great director, great editing, appropriate music, Believable actors and actresses, cinematography. You know, the Bible has the best director ever. Believable actors and actresses. You have the Holy Spirit as the editor. Can't get any better than that. Music, eh, cinematography, eh, didn't exist back then, but it doesn't matter. The stories of the Bible are for yours and my edification. We get a better understanding of God, we gain ideas of hope and significance, and we better see ourselves in the place, in our place in this world. So, with that said, let's begin. Chapter 1. A long time ago, in a land far, far away. Star Wars, in case you missed that. A little orphan girl looked forward to an uncertain future because her parents had died. She was afraid, she was lonely, until an older cousin stepped forward and he took her into his house and raised her as his own child. His cousin taught her to fear God and blessed her with charm, that God had blessed her with charm and beauty and that surpassed all the, will, uh, the women in the entire Persian kingdom. Seeing that God was with her, her husband did all he could to ensure that she understood God's will and God in general. This is a story of Esther and her cousin Mordecai, or uncle. Esther is derived from the Persian word stara, which means star. That was not her real name. Her real name was Hadassah. Hadassah means myrtle tree, which comes from the evergreen family of trees. Thus, the name Hadassah spoke of fruitfulness and fertility. In this book that bears her name, God is never mentioned in this, in this book. But there may be no other book in the Bible where God is more visible. The providence of God shines through clearly as we see him working out his plan in the ten short chapters of the book of Esther. We also see the depth of Mordecai's faith and Esther's humility and courageous submission and denying herself and risking her life for her people. And two incidences stand out particularly in this story that Mordecai is he mourns for his brethren and Esther's humble self-sacrifice. When we see their examples clearly, our own trials seem much more endurable and conquerable. Most of us tend to see the biblical characters as untouchables. We think we'll never rise to the faith of Abraham, the meekness of Moses, the, po the patience of Job, or the boldness of uh, John the Baptist. People face the same challenges that you and I face today. They had to grapple with their carnality just like you and I do. Human nature has not changed since the Garden of Eden. Many of the biblical characters are single adults. I don't know if you know that or not. It's a good idea then that 
when we read stories like this one, to remember that the biblical characters we're reading about had no great advantage over us. They were single adults just like you and I. They were ordinary men and women. Some didn't even know God. They did not have halos over their head. And as the saying goes, they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you do every morning. Even as Esther became queen of Persia and Mordecai became King Azarius' prime minister, they're very much like this, very much like us. Think about this for a second. Because in today's world, Iran and Israel are at loggerheads, and who knows what's going to happen between those two countries. Back in the time of Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Two Jews had two of the highest offices in the kingdom. Talk about the sovereignty of God. It's amazing. So Esther rises from a nobody to become queen. So chapter 1, Esther begins with the king of uh, Persia, as Azarius, given a huge feast for his, the princes of the land. He wanted them to see his great wealth his mighty army, and as was the kingdom of the uh, custom, custom of those times, to show off his harem of beautiful women. The Bible says that this feast lasted six months. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a cook back then, I'd get really tired of cooking the same beef every day for six months. But this thing went on for six months. Flavius Josephus, who was a Roman uh, historian in the time of Jesus, says that this feast was to... Uh, commemorate the conclusion of a three-and-a-half-year program preparing for war where they built and trained a 2.6 million man army, which, by the way, I think our army in the United States is 400,000. <laughs> this is way bigger than us. And they built a one-mile-long floating bridge made out of boats so the king and the army could cross over water boundaries. It's pretty smart. Pretty amazing. After this feast, the king had an. Uh, uh, after this king, there was another feast for the common people of Shushan in his capital. And on the seventh day, the king summoned the current queen, Vashti was her name, to appear before his guests. And for some odd reason, she said, I "Ain't going nowhere." Some Bible uh, uh, scholars uh, think that, and based on what's going on, history, etc., that she was. Uh, she was um, summoned to appear before all these drunken guys naked. That's true. I don't blame queen, the queen. But the king got very mad, angry, and by her refusal, and later signed a decree that she would be stripped of her crown and never to see him again. Her house was taken away and probably everything else she owned. Chapter 2 begins about a year later. The king decides to fill the vacancy left by Queen uh, Vashti. And so another decree is sent out throughout the realm that all the young virgins be brought to Shushan, which is the capital of Persia at that time, for the king's evaluation. Hmm. wonder what that was like. Thought I'd get a little more rise out of that one. I guess not. Hearing of the decree, Mordecai brings Esther to a guy named uh, Hegai, Hegai. Hegei is the eunuch in charge of the king's harem. And Hegei is immediately taken with Esther. She's a knockout. And she's very humble. She's got a very sweet demeanor about her. And he turns around and gives her seven maids, the best part of the house, and all the perfumes and ointments that any virgin girl could possibly dream of. Now, gals, I'm sure you can relate to that. At least my wife can. I look in the drawers in, in her bathroom. She's got the master bedroom. Man, she's got all sorts of stuff going on in there. I'm like, what in the world is that? Oh, that's for this, that's for that. I'm, I'm not a girl, what do I know? But uh, I do know that one of her favorite places to go is to see her friend uh, Michelle Madrid, who works at Nordstrom's in the Lancome counter, so you can kind of figure out the rest on that. It was the, Persia, it was the custom of Persia at that time that versions be kept in the house of women for one year for purification. And after that time, they would appear one by one before the king. So he could choose one to be the next queen. The Roman historian Josephus tells us that 400 versions appeared before the king. I don't know if that was a woman every night, a one every other night. I don't know. But the king must have been one heck of a guy. 
to be able to pull that one out. 400 ladies, oh my goodness. When it comes time for Esther to appear before the king, like Haggai, Haggai, the king is also captivated by her and selects her to be the queen, next queen of Persia. And according to Esther chapter 2, the king loves her so much that more than all the women, she attained grace and favor and a sight more than all the other ones. And so he takes the, the uh, what do you call that thing? The women wear a, no, what is that? The tiara? Tiara? Ta tiara? Whatever, uh, whatever, and puts on her head instead. Chapter 3, here comes trouble. I don't know what you said, but I'll go with it. This details the promotion of the story's bad guy. It's a fellow by the name of Haman. And he was risen to a place where he was over all of the king's princesses throughout the realm. And from what we read of him, Haman's promotion goes straight to his head. And he considers himself above others, meaning he was full of pride and arrogance. The, can, the king commands that all the people of the land should bow before Haman, just as they would bow before the king. However, there's one guy that says, I ain't bound to nobody. You happen to know who that is? Mordecai. Mordecai was a man. He knew that there was only one king and one God, and he ain't bound before some guy. Mordecai's anger grows every time he passes by Mordecai. Mordecai's hatred may also be fueled by the fact that he is an Amalekite. And the Amalekite and Mordecai is a Jew. And the Amalekites and the Jews have been fighting each other for centuries. It all goes back to you know, when Israel was coming out of the, uh, the wilderness. The Amalekites resisted the Israelites. King Saul, who is Israel's first king, fell out of favor with God because he didn't do what God told him to do, which was to handle the Amalekites. And if you read the story, God just basically said, kill them all. Men, women, children, animals, whatever, obliterate them. And God, you're thinking, God said that? Well, if you understand what's taking place, uh, God was angry with the Amalekites, plus their sin had run its course. So, Haman devises a plan to not only get rid of Mordecai, but also all the Jews of the realm. And so with the king's approval, a decree goes out that on a certain date, the Persians were okay to kill all the Jews. Now at this point, taking a step back, the circumstances that now confront Esther demand a closer look. She has to, what she has to do must have been really difficult. She's been living off the lamb for years now. She's got it all. She's got makeup. She's got perfume. She's got the best food, the best vegetables, the best makeup, the best hairdresser. She's got it all. She's lost touch with being a commoner. And the king, and she probably had a few uh, interests and pursuits uh, on top of that, or hobbies. The king even tells her, and he tells you about his love for the king, is that when she comes in, he says to Esther, what do you want? Up to half of the kingdom is yours. What do you want? So she had it all. For Mordecai's part, Mordecai comes by the woman's court every day to see how Esther's doing and checking in with her, with, in with her. Undoubtedly, Mordecai is her closest advisor and keeps her feet planted on the ground. Mordecai probably suspects at this time that God has put Esther in a position, a position that is one of great power and influence. Any married guy will tell you, who runs the household? The wife just makes you think that you run the household. She is the boss of the household. They say, happy wife, happy life, right? Learn five letters. Yes, honey, I am sorry. Okay? If you get those five words down, you're a winner. His constant, Mordecai's constant, Talking to uh, Esther prepares her for what's letting yet ahead. Okay, next chapter. Mordecai learns of the plot that Haman is, uh, is hatched. He tears his clothes, and he goes into the king's gate, and he's wearing sack sackcloth and ashes, and nobody went to the king's gate wearing sackcloth and ashes. It was unlawful. As the king's decree spreads throughout the kingdom, the Jews of the realm are putting on sackcloth and ashes and weeping and fasting. Plainly, Mordecai's weeping for his brethren is real. It's, it's heartfelt. 
It's not ritualistic or put on to get sympathy. If anything, he's likely mourning before God for deliverance for his people. God, what are we going to do? King's decree is out there. We're going to get hammered. Esther's servants, this is funny about Esther. Esther's servants bring word to her of her husband's emotional anguish, so she sends him some new clothes. It's interesting, she doesn't even bother to find out why he's mourning. But she sends him new clothes. Okay. Here's her cousin, whom she loves dearly, perhaps more than her parents, and she tries to quench his grief without ascertaining the cause. Perhaps she's fearful of his actions to reveal herself as a Jewish, a Jewess, because the king didn't know at this point what her heritage was. Or maybe she feels like his public mornings will bring embarrassment to her, the king. Who knows? But Mordecai refuses her tokens of comfort. So she sends a chamber, uh, chamberlain to find out why is he mourning. And Mordecai responds, instructing her what she's got to do. And also sending along a copy of the king's decree. Hey, wake up. Mordecai charges her to go to the king and beseech him to spare their people's lives. Esther still, second time around, tries to avoid being involved by sending word back to him, saying that everyone knows if she goes into the king without being called, she may well be killed, which was true. You never approached the king unless he had summoned you, and there was only one way out of that. We'll talk about that in a second. Perhaps Esther allows her fears to get the most of her at this point, just as trials for all of us are not easy, this was not a walk in the park for Esther. She was probably scared that she's going to lose everything she had, terrified that she's going to die. The one if, what ifs are probably playing out in her head, just as they do to us. Mordecai answers sternly a third time and warns her that even though she's queen, she will not be safe from Haman's decree of thugs. His faith, however, never wa wavers, for he tells Esther that if deliverance for the Jews does not come through her, it's going to come through somebody else. Haman, or excuse me, uh, Mordecai understood God and the providence of God. In the back of her mind, she probably knew all along what she had to do. The next step she takes would come, excuse me, the next step she takes is what should come to a godly-minded person. She sends word to Mordecai, fast and pray with all the Jews of the city for three days. For her part, she says, my maids and I will fast alike, and I'll go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. For Esther, there's no only one way out of this. She's got to submit to God's will, and she's got to go to the king. And that meant death. So Esther gets all dolled up, gets her best perfume on, best hairdo, got the makeup going on. She's looking fine, as any queen would as she approaches the king. And so she comes to the door. Sir king, sire, my beloved husband. She knows right away it could be death. But he, the king, stretches out. The only way out of it for her was the king would stretch out his scepter, and she would enter the room, and she would touch the top of the scepter. He is saying, welcome, come on in. And that's what he does. He loved his queen. Step one's done. Here comes step two. The king knows that something's on Esther's mind. He just didn't show up to the king without something going on. He knows. And so she asks that the king and Haman comes to a queen's banquet. Sounds good. Obviously, the king loves banquets. He's just celebrated six months uh, of banquets a few years ago. So she invited they come to the banquet. She invites him back again to the next night. But during the day, during the night, the king can't sleep. Here comes the sleeplessness. And so he calls for the books of the records or the chronicles to be read before the king, before him. And the king, a part of that is read where Mordecai had saved the life of the king from assassination, but was never rewarded. So by chance, in the morning, guess who shows up at the king's door? Haman. Comes to the king. But the king turns the tables on Haman. And ask him, what should the king do for if I want to honor a man? Step three. The plot is thickening here. Haman suggests a royal robe that the king has worn be put on this individual. The individual should be on a royal steed that the king has uh, ridden on. And a royal crown should be put on his head. Then paraded around the city. 
Haman is so arrogant and prideful in thinking that the king wants to honor him. But the king wants to honor Mordecai. And Haman hates Mordecai. And then Haman is given the job of parading Mordecai all around the city going, here is the man who the king wishes to honor. <laughs> Haman knows he's in trouble. Then the king and Haman go to Esther's second banquet, and her petition is to save her life from Haman's decree. The king goes out on the balcony. Haman knows he's a dead man. She's sitting on the, the royal couch. He's falling all over the couch to try to uh, appeal for his life. The king comes in and goes, whoa, you're trying to attack my wife as well? He's out the door, and he is hung. Amazing. Now, what about the decree for the killing of all the Jews of the realm? Once a king makes a decree, <laughs> it's done deal. So the king makes another decree. It says all the Jews of the realm may protect themselves. And the fear of God fell upon the Persians, and the Jews protected themselves. And uh, according to history, 75,000 Persians were killed in self-defense by the Jews. An amazing turn of events. Is this a coincidence, or, or is it a display of divine providence? That's a hard question to answer. Just kidding. It's a display of God's providence. Next chapter. God lifts us up. When we face trials, it is very hard, for, and it's very hard for us to see past our present circumstances. Sometimes we just cannot see the purpose of God that's being worked out in yours and our lives. This is because of our shortcomings, our failings, our failed human nature, and also because of self-centeredness. But God always has a perspective on the long view, the long range of facts. Mordecai's Reminder to Esther pointed this out to her. She pushes down her fears and puts her life on the line to help others. The book of Esther is a perfect example of loving and outgoing concern that we all should have practicing towards our brethren. That means you and I, that we should be looking out for each other. Because the Apostle Paul tells us in the New Testament that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And again, he says, let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. You and I are supposed to be concerned about one another. Mordecai mourns greatly for the welfare of his brethren. Esther, after much soul searching, submits to God's will and allows him to work through her. And both of these are examples of good works, of sacrificing one's life and self to bring benefit to others. And finally, these works don't go unrewarded. God exalts Mordecai, the prime minister of the realm, a position of great wealth, trust, responsibility, prestige over all of Persia. Esther remains the loyal and faithful wife of the king, and from all indications, her wealth and power in the realm increase as well. God is certainly faithful and generous to those who, humble, who humbly live his way of loving, concern, and self-sacrifice. Amazing. That would be like today having uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to become uh, the prime minister of Iran today, next to the, uh, underneath the Ayatollah. You think that would ever happen in a million years? It's not going to happen. War is about to break out over there, especially what's going on in the last couple of days with the United States and Iran. Pretty uh, interesting. We're throwing missiles at each other, folks. But think about that, how God had placed two foreigners to become people of great influence and second only to the king. It's amazing. So as single adults, what are some takeaways that we see from the story of Esther and Mordecai's life? Now, there's a lot more to be said on this story. I've just given you the highlights. So here comes the slides. Uh, Mike, I think that we're in here. Not... Consequences, not listening to God. Had Esther not listened to Mordecai, the Jews could have been wiped out, and there would be no Savior, there would be no Jesus Christ, there would be no fulfillment of other Old Testament prophecies. What happens when we don't listen to God? Mordecai makes a point to Esther that if she doesn't rise up, deliverance will come from somebody else. We need to make sure 
that our spiritual antennas are operational <coughs> and well-tuned to hear God speaking to us, or we'll miss a blessing and an opportunity that God had originally in store for you to do or me to do. If we're not listening, the opportunity passes us by. You see the power of prayer and fasting. Number two, in the New Testament, there are eight references to fasting in the New Testament Gospels. There is something about prayer and fasting that works. My thoughts on this is that when we are denying our flesh, we demonstrate our seriousness about an issue with God. We're saying, God, this is important here. Because doesn't Jesus say in Matthew, ask and you'll receive? Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. What's the purpose of that? It's for us to seek him because we're telling God this is important. That's why I'm, I have been calling you to prayer on uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. This is important to me and the elder board and hopefully to you as well that we prosper and flourish. Eight times. See, you see the sovereignty of God lived out in people's lives. Esther was born an orphan. Excuse me, she became an orphan Jewish girl that rose to become the queen of Persia. She had access to the man. Mordecai, also a pious Jew, did the right thing in protecting the, uh, the pagan king. And his faithfulness enabled him to be risen to the uh, level of prime minister of the entire realm. You see hands, God's hand in preserving the Jewish nation, and you see God's providence in the lives of Esther and Mordecai, and if you search hard and long, not only if you just read it, but all the other Old Testament saints like Daniel, Gideon, Rahab, King David, Samuel, Jeremiah, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, all walked by faith, and many of those folks were single. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, everybody knows the story of Daniel and the lion's den. They're all single. God used to change and encourage us today. Gideon, as far as we know, single guy. Esther and Mordecai, at points in their lives, they were single. What about you? As we live out the sovereignty of God in our lives, is your place or work station in life sovereignly assigned by God? You may be retired. You may be working. doesn't matter. Do you think that God is sovereignly placing you where you're at today? Absolutely. You may not be a queen or a prime minister, but God does orchestrate events in our lives, and he presents them to us as opportunities to be used of him. And since that is true, who are you reaching with the gospel? Who in your family needs to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Who needs an uplifting word? I had a lady come up to me two nights ago at Costco. We both, it's late in the evening. And everybody takes breaks. There's a break room, and there's all, you know, food and all, all that stuff. And this girl comes up to me and says, Thomas, I, Pastor Thomas, i got to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, sure. And I'm sitting there with a Starbucks coffee, and I brought in earlier, and I put it in the locker room so that I could warm it up later on in the evening because you're working to about 10, 30, 11, and you can use a little juice from caffeine. And so she gets her, 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 her food, and she sits down, and she tells me this story. And she's not a believer, guys. She's not a Christian. And she's telling me this heavy that's going on in her life and in her, in her home. It's her home that some relatives are living there, and she needs to get them out. And she was asking for, do you know anybody who could help me get these people out of my house? And I, through the talking of that, I could see I had no answers. You know, I mean, I have answers, but she'd already walked through them. But I, I knew that there was one thing that would comfort her at that moment, was to stop and just pray for her. And I said, you know, this may be an uncomfortable uh, situation here, but do you mind if I pray for you? You can keep looking at me, but I'm gonna talk, I want to talk to God for you. Is that okay? She's like, yeah. And I went on for 10 minutes praying for her and asking God for a deliver. I don't know the rest of the story yet. I didn't see her yell out tonight. That works, so I don't know what's going on. But opportunities come our way all the time. Maybe she'll come to know the Lord. Maybe she, I, I know she's constantly, hi, Thomas, hi, Pastor. You know, a lot of the folks know what I do, and they're coming, you know. Now, 
fun place. Don't make a whole lot of money. But you know what? That's where God has me right now. It may not last forever. The story, I mean, the seasons of our life come and go. Chapters come and go. For all of us. Even when you're retired. It doesn't matter. But is God using us and orchestrating opportunities for you and I? I rest my case on that. Uh, number, where am I? Help me out there. You see the heart of Esther and Mordecai. For, uh, I'm not going to go there. You, are, you see their heart. They were spiritually attuned to God's presence. And as single adults, I think you and I, I think you guys have the best opportunities in how to reach people and build the kingdom, even more than married folks. And finally, God's enemies are going to get their reward, either in this life or in the life to come. Haman got his. He got hung the next morning on gallows that he had prepared to hang Mordecai on. He gets hung on. There are people in your life that have done you wrong. There are people in your life that don't know the Lord and they've done you wrong. And you go, where's the recom uh, recompense? Where's the justice? When is God going to do something? He will. That's his promise. You read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 5 through 9. It, Paul is very clear. God always has the last word. And we walk by faith and we trust that God will have the last word. So one of the things we need to ask ourselves a question is, are we a, a God's enemy? I am sure most of you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Praise the Lord if you do. If you don't, see me afterwards. Let's get that one handled. But there's a lot right in on that question. Does God care about the single adult? I would argue he's darn right he does. This may have escaped your notice. I got a big surprise for you. Do you know God's single? God the Father has no wife. The Holy Spirit has no wife. Jesus doesn't have a wife yet. There is the wedding feast of the Lamb coming, which the church is married to Jesus Christ. But right now... The Godhead, for all eternity, has been single. Hey, don't let that one <laughs> your mind, you know? I think that's really cool, you know? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think God is uh, choosing, you know, single versus married. Both are blessed in Scripture. But, spoiler alert, they're single. So, Mordecai and Esther, people that God used, single adults, to change the world. Can God change the world through you? Heck, yes. Maybe a different world, maybe a different kingdom, but all of us are tr strategically placed in our lives where we are at to extend the kingdom to just one more soul. As the band comes up, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for the privilege it is to know you. Thank you that you have a heart for single adults. You're single. Half our population single. And you can use people for your glory and honor and praise. This life is really short. 60, 70 years, 80, maybe 90, maybe over 100 like my grandma's live into 103. But still, what's 103 compared to eternity? It's just a vapor. It's just a breath of smoke that vanishes in seconds. So Lord, help us to have the long view like you have. Help us to understand and know that this life is so short, but what we do in this life impacts eternity, both for our lives as well as the people that we're touching on a day-by-day -day basis, whoever they may be. Father, help us to keep our heads attuned to you. Help us in our spiritual walk with you. If we're not walking the walk, help us to identify the areas where we're out of line. May the Holy Spirit speak truth to us, lovingly as he always does. But if there's areas of our life that are out of alignment with you, help us to see and make correction. Father, 
I thank you so much that I am included in your family. I don't deserve having one iota. As Paul said, I'm a chief of sinners, and I resemble that remark. But you've been so gracious to me. So allow me into your family, and to all of us in this room into your family, and to any who call upon the name of the Lord, they are ushered into your great family that we will be with each other and with you for all eternity. Thank you so much for that privilege that you've given to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand together one more time? What an encouraging message. Lord, sanctify and consecrate our lives to you that we might be used by you mightily. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always on. to him.
can be seated. I remember hearing the story of Frances Havergal who wrote this song. I believe her dad was a missionary and she went on a missions trip and she went away and she came back so convicted of wanting to share the gospel and consecrate her life to the Lord that she stayed up all night long by candlelight writing every word in this song. And she went on to give away every treasure she had, her jewelry, everything, all to be more useful to the Lord, that nothing would get in the way. And that's our prayer tonight, amen, that we would be used by him to be a light for him. And sometimes it's not necessarily by preaching at people, but simply by being a light, by being God's hands and feet and loving on people. Amen? Amen. As we continue in this time of worship, we are actually going to go ahead and take the offering tonight. Um, as we do, um, we're going to pray together as a family and pray over these gifts, but we do have a few different ways uh, to give that we wanted to make you aware of. Um, of course, you can go to our website, ocsinglesforchrist.org. You can click on the giving button there. You can also set up an auto pay, which is super easy and takes the think work out of it. You can also use the Zelle app. Of course, you can go to the app and send directly by using that email that is posted above. You can also go through your banking app or banking institution online. They often use the Zelle interface. And of course, you can also mail in a check um, if you have cash tonight, just a reminder, envelopes are in the seat backs in front of you. So you can grab an envelope there if you have a check or cash tonight. And of course, as always, we just want to say thank you so much for partnering with us. It is no small thing as you sow seeds into this ministry, into God's work, into kingdom work. We just want to say thank you so much for partnering with us as always as the family of God. And I'll leave us with this offering thought. Proverbs 3, nine says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops. So Lord, tonight we just pray. We thank you for the privilege of giving back to you tonight. Lord, we give back to you with our worship, with our time, with our words, with our countenance, with our personalities, by loving you and loving one another. And Lord, we desire to give all to you so that you can use our offerings, our meager offerings in mighty ways. So Lord, take these gifts, multiply them and use them for your glory, for your plans and purposes as you see fit. And we thank you so much for those giving and sowing into this ministry tonight bless every heart in Jesus name. Amen. Ushers and elders can come on forward to collect the offering tonight. Lord, I need you.
Well, once again, we just want to say thank you so much for worshiping with us tonight. God bless you guys. And I think Thomas has a few final remarks for us. And thank Jessica and the band. We need you every hour. I love that song. Amen. Okay, so a couple things here. I am your, oh, the pastor tonight teaching, and I'm also the MC tonight because mm -hmm. our MC couldn't make it tonight. So uh, the band's going to kind of do their thing in the background here, unless they're going to stand there for five minutes, but I think they need to go home. So do our thing. anyway, a couple of things, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, I have a tendency to do announcements very quickly, so get your thinking cap on, and the announcements are all new tonight, so uh, keep up. Thank you. Okay, first off, number one is uh, for those of you who may have enjoyed the uh, worship service tonight and our time in the Word, you're welcome to go to our Facebook page and... Spread the word and the share button underneath the little TV set that you see on Facebook. Share with whoever you want, and uh, we invite you to do so. Also, I do want uh, it's uh, facebook.com forward slash OC Singles for Christ. Also, the week has a tendency to throw curveballs at us, so if you ever need prayer during the week, we have a prayer team that meets on Thursday nights. And so if I get an email from you or a phone call, and you wish for me to share it off, to, uh, uh, I pray for all you, everybody, but also to uh, the team. We're here for you. So it's prayer at ocsfc1.org. Next slide. All right, stay in touch. Okay, for those of you who may, and most of you are, that uh, you're welcome to be on our uh, newsletter that uh, goes out every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. And also, if you happen to be on Meetup, you can just go to Meetup. Now, that's our resource table. That's right over there. And uh, you'll find uh, different kinds of paraphernalia. Uh, business cards, if you want to invite a friend, free. Take them. Postcards. Tells us who we are. A little bit bigger for those who can't see the postcards, which I resemble. Uh, you can take those, as many as you want, and uh, let people know about us. Word of mouth is the best form of advertising, so you're welcome to tell anybody you uh, know that uh, we are here every single Friday night, except the last Friday of the year. All right, next slide. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, we're going quick. Get involved. Next slide. Okay, so we have a couple opportunities to serve here. We have a, I believe, the cafe team is full now. Uh, I believe the greeting team is full. Marsha, are you in the room? That's full, right? Okay, we're good. There are two teams that do need help. Uh, Nick Cusinella, where's, uh, where's Nick? He's not here tonight. Okay, I believe we need... Uh, Let's skip to the events team. So the events team is a team that we used to have that got wiped out uh, when COVID hit. And we do all sorts of stuff, hiking and movie nights and, you know, go to the Ronald Reagan Library or whatever you want to do. And so we need to reconstitute an events team. And so if you have an uh, anchoring for doing events and helping out in that area, come see me afterwards. We need to build a team of about 10 people. So next slide. Upcoming events. Here we go, guys. Here's the new stuff. Number one, can you believe it? Good Friday is just two weeks away. Now, uh, I just found out that uh, we're going to be here at 7 o'clock, not 7.30. I was originally told at 7.30 to 8.30. It's actually 7 to 8 is our Good Friday service. Still here. Jessica and some of the band will be here to lead us in worship along with this is going to be a combined worship service with Pacific Church of Irvine, which is this church, and ourselves. That'll be a beautiful evening. And then afterwards, we're going to do a fellowship dinner. And uh, in the past, we've been at Watermark, uh, our previous location. There was a restaurant not even a mile away, uh, which was Acapulco Restaurant. We are trying to find a restaurant that's reasonably priced and uh, that we'll go to afterwards, or we may just do a fellowship dinner here. We haven't put those details together, but I guarantee you by next Friday, you'll know. Next slide. All right, what is this one here? This is the next uh, free dance at Moon Go Coffee Roasters in Costa Mesa. It's on April 15th, the same day that your taxes are due. So pay your taxes by the 15th. 
and then come and breathe a sigh of relief or a nice warm cup of coffee and dance to your heart's content for a couple hours. Next slide. All right, so there is a wi women, women, guys, check out for two minutes. Women, this is for you. This church, the ladies put on a monthly tea. Excuse, uh, I think it's every month or every other month. And uh, you are invited to their next tea. Us guys, we can crash the party, but eh, we'll leave you alone. So the, the event is a, the power of a story. And it's going to be from 1230 to 2.30 here at this church. Uh, it is free. However, a suggested donation for the food is 10 bucks. But you do have to sign up. So there's two ways to sign up, ladies. On the back table there, there is a card. Front side says the T. The back side, uh, I don't know if I made a slide for the back side. Maybe I don't think I did. But that gives you the link and where to sign up. They just want to know you're coming. Okay? So either one of these things, it's a lot of fun. I'm told that it's they, 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 have, they have a killer party, from what I'm told. All right, so next slide. <clears throat> hey, our next dance is coming up called Motown Grooves. So we have a live band called MC Express. We have a DJ. His name is F1, in parentheses. You know, DJs always have their weird names, okay? This DJ is F1. It'll be Saturday night, the last Saturday of the month, 6 to 1130. There will be a nice, beautiful Mediterranean dinner that will be provided, and the cost has gone up a little bit to buy $2. We are finding that our expenses are just going up. We've been trying to hold the line, and uh, we just are at that place where we just couldn't. So it's 27 bucks here on Friday night. It's Friday night, or you want to go online, it's 28 bucks. And if you want to save yourself $10, do all that before the 28th, uh, because the sign-ups online stop on the 28th, which is a Friday night, and then the price goes to 37 bucks. Now, all that stuff will, is already online. Next slide. That's all I'm going to say about that. What's next? Okay, so we have our next potluck. How many of you here last Friday night for the potluck? Raise your hands. I know there was a lot of you here because you, the food was gone. And I don't know what happened with all the, uh, the beef. What's the beef called? Corn beef. I don't know where it all went, but there was a bunch of stuff when I looked. I didn't even get any. <laughs> But anyway, this next one will be a Mexican theme. So, tacos, enchiladas, Spanish rice, guac and chips, tortilla soup, get creative, Mexican food theme. You bring chicken, I'm throwing it right out the door, okay? So, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. It's Mexican theme. So, we will spread out the tables and we will have something like the game show that we had last Friday night, which... Hey, thank you for all your responses. I got a lot of great responses on that game show that was graciously put on by Yamo and uh, Trisha. Did a great job with that. Yeah, give it up. It was really a lot of fun. So that is our next potluck, and that takes us to the end of announcements, I believe. No? Okay, yeah, you see the website. Next slide. Let's go. Let's go. Tonight's events. Okay, now tonight's events, elder prayer. Do we have enough elders tonight? Bill, uh, one, and we got, okay, well, the elder prayer behind that window over there. If you want elder prayer, the guys will be there for 20 minutes, okay? If you go outside the door, just make a left and make another left into the first door, you're there. Next slide, karaoke tonight, uh, 9.30 to uh, what? 9.30 to 11.30 in Fellowship Hall. Okay, that's karaoke, and here will be ping pong. We're also coming up with super karaoke. What is super karaoke all about? Show up next Friday night. I'll tell you all about it. Next slide. Okay. It's birthday Friday. So our resident baker in chief, Dodie Urbanski, who makes the desserts. This is one of the birthday cakes. So now, if your birthday was in, is in March, which we still have a whole nother week, stand up. We're not going to ask you to do anything other than just stand up. And stay standing. Okay, so we have Ruth way in the back. Uh, Ruth's birthday was yesterday, which was on 3 23 23. That was pretty cool. Anybody else with a March birthday? Okay, so we've got, I can't see, but we have three ladies, I believe. Anybody else? All right, so join me as we just wish everybody a happy birthday on the count of three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear ladies. Happy birthday to you. Hey, wait a second. There is a guy that had a birthday this week. Yamo had a birthday two days ago. So, nice try. I just happened to see you back there going, he had a birthday in March as well. Now, here's the deal, guys. So we have a cake right there. Hey, what is that cake? Irish cream. And then there is another one that is for us chocolate lovers, brownie. Yeah. Okay, those will be in the fellowship hall immediately following. What else do we got here? Oh, next slide. Next slide. What do we got? What do we got? That's it. God bless you guys. The house lights are going to come on. Have a great night. Stay as long as you want till midnight.